recording button. All right, so we are recording now. Good audio and the video is good. All right, so I think I got this answer already on the other day. Okay, so we are moving on to the second question, which is one of my favorite questions in this particular exam. So we're going to, oh, okay, what is that? Oh, it's looking, looking up the dictionary because I long press a button. There we go. All right, so this is question number two out of four. This one has to do with probability, um, but not like the first one. So we'll, we'll go ahead and analyze the story. When you see a question like this as a word question, what you want to do is to make sure that you understand what the question is asking. And as you do that, try to relate it to definitions that we have already talked about in this class. So that means you're know, having the definitions you know, with you during the exam is going to be helpful because you can try to make a match between the definitions and also you know, the word problem that we have here. All right, so I'm going to read the, the question. A fuzzy is a stuffed animal toy that contains electronics to interact with children, which is basically another name for a Furby. And you know, I cannot believe the Furby is now a thing again. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? What a Furby is? Okay. So if you don't know, you know, look it up. Furby is F U R F U R and B I E V, your Furby. <clears throat> so this one is manufactured by the Lion Electronics, hence Lion. Um, and Tech GPT is an unregulated GPT AI entity originated from the lab of an amoral professor. Tech GPT has infiltrated Lion to secretly add a GPT backend to some of the Furbies. In a shipping box of 100 Furbies, eight of them have a secret GPT backend. The GPT backend makes a fuzzy behave slightly differently from a regular fuzzy. Lion has the quality assurance process by spot checking. Each spot check randomly pick, picks, okay, grammar mistake here, picks six Furbies out of uh, fuzzies out of a shipping box and test each picked f fuzzy based on its behavior. Tech GPT using its nine year old theory of mind cap capacity capability has determined that as long as no more than three fuzzies in the random spot check of a shipping box exhibit the different behavior, there will be no suspicion of the world domination scheme. All right, so yes, you know, it is a little bit dramatic. It looks like a story, but what are we getting out of the setup? Yes. <laughs> and tech GPT obviously is an abbreviation of some kind that has nothing to do with me. All right, so we have a shipping box of 100. Okay, so that's important, okay? So let's pick out all the numbers that are significant in this case. So in 100, in a box of 100 fuzzies, eight of them will have the secret GPD backend. Are we good so far? So right here in your mind, you have to think about this as, okay, 100 to, altogether, eight is GPT hacked, and 92 are not, okay? So there are two kinds of fuzzies, 92 of one kind, eight of the other kind. So right here, you know, you can, there are a few things that can come to your mind. Um, is it like a lotto problem or is it a um, binomial distribution, like you're know, flipping coins, okay? Because both can have, you know, this has a, a relationship to both of those, okay, at, at least at this point. So now the next number is a six, okay? What, what is this six representing? So the six is we are picking six fuzzies out of a box for quality assurance, okay? So imagine that you have a box of 100 of these things. We know 92 are okay, eight are hacked, and we are picking six for testing, okay? Out of the six that, is, that we use for testing, we want to have no more than three um, that would have the change or the different behavior, which is based because, because they're hacked. So we are looking for cases where out of the six that you are spot checking, having zero, you know, exhibiting the change behavior is great. Having one is not a problem. Having two 
is not a problem, but having three or more is going to be a problem. Is that okay? All right. Uh, three or more. Okay, so has determined as long as no more than three in the random spot check exhibited different behavior. So three is the top limit. You're correct. So zero, one, two, three out of six is okay. But the moment we have four, five, or six, then you know, we'll raise suspicion that something is wrong. Is that okay? All right. All right, so part one is really trying to help you identify what problem we are facing here, what kind of a um, discrete probability problem we are having. So the quest first question is, how many trials are there in an experiment? So, and it often tells you, it also even tells you a spot check of fuzzies in the shipping box is one experiment. This is a, this is a big hint, okay? Because now you're going like, okay, we're choosing, we're picking six you know, fuzzies out of the box, and that is considered a, an experiment, okay? So the next question is, how many trials do we have in an experiment? What should be the answer to that question? Six, that is correct, okay? Because we are choosing six things out of a box of 100. Um, so each time we choose one thing out of the box is one trial of the experiment. So the answer to this one, uh, okay. I have to turn off you know, some of the touch thing. Let me see, because you know, that's bothering me. So slide is okay, system bar gesture, bottom gesture, side gesture. Maybe turn that on, maybe turn that off too. There we go. All right, so we have six here. What is the number of possible outcomes in the first trial? Okay, yep. Mm -hmm. I am recording, yes. Yeah, audio is good, and uh, the video is good too. So everything is, is good at this point. All right, so the next question is, what is the number of possible outcomes from the first trial? Okay. And then the next question is, what are the trial outcome with, are the out, trial outcomes with or without replacement? And then the last one is, is the ordering of outcomes between trials um, important? Okay. So let's answer the second question. What is the number of possible outcomes from the first trial? In other words, what, are the, what is the number of possibilities in this case? So there are, hmm? Um, no, no, it's 100. There, because you're choosing six things out of a box of 100, and this is your first trial. This is your first trial. So at that point, you have 100 items out of the box, and you could have chosen any one of those as the first fuzzy to be tested. Yeah. So the correct answer is 100 in this case. Okay, so let me just pause, okay, because you know, there, there's a, an alternative answer of 2, okay? Because you know, some people may say, oh, it's 2 because, you know, the fuzzy may fail the test or it may not fail the test. But that's not what this is asking, okay? We are only performing, you know, we are only asking how many ways can each trial, you know, how many, how many possibilities? And there are 100 fur, uh, fuzzies in the box. So that's why there are 100. So the next question asks, are the trial outcomes with or without replacement? What do you think? In other words, what about the second trial? How many possibilities do we have for the second trial? 99, because the first one, you don't put it back in the box to be chosen again. So that means you know, this is without replacement, okay? And then the last one is asking, is the ordering of the outcome you know, between trial important? So the question is basically asking, um, if I choose you know, three that fail the test and then three that would not fail the test, is that important you know, versus you know, I choose three that would not fail the test and then three that would fail the test? Does it matter? No, nope, because we are only asking as a total, do we have at least, uh, do we have up to three that 
would fail the test. Okay, it's okay to have up to three, but four, five, and six is not okay. So the answer to the last one is it is not important. So the answer is no. All right. So based on part one, okay, you know, assuming we got every single one of these points, what is the total number of possible outcomes for a spot check of six fuzzies out of a shipping box? You can you can see how you know in the second question or part two, it doesn't care about whether we are detecting there's a problem here or not. It is only asking about how many outcomes do we get out of a spot check. So what do you think? We already know there are 100 possible outcomes from the first trial. Okay, that's point number one. There are six trials, and it is without replacement. And we know ordering is not important. So what do you think is the answer to part two? But that will give you the number of permutations, but we already know the ordering is not important. So what would, how would you adjust that so that ordering is not taken into consideration? Hmm? Divide what you said, what you know, Jacob said, by you know, six factorial. But there's a special name for that whole thing as well. What is that whole thing? It is related to Pascal's identity because Pascal's identity is what led us to um, work on um, the binomial theorem. But Pascal's identity also did one additional thing. It is also how we can potentially compute uh, the number of combinations because that's what Pascal's triangle is, is combinations. So the answer to this question is, is 100 choose 6 or combine 106. Because we're looking at, if we choose six items out of 100, what is the total number of combinations in that case? Is that okay? So in other words, okay, you imagine that you have a, a, a big bag of marbles, and each marble is numbered, okay, from one to 100. The question is, if I were to choose to you know, pick six marbles out of the big bag and put it into a smaller bag, as my private zero stash, the question is, how many possible ways can I choose six marbles so that they become my marbles? Ordering is not important, okay? It's a question of, do I have number two in my bag? Do I have number 10 in my bag? And so on, but you know, the ordering is not important. So that's why it is 100 choose six, which the other notation is this. So if you want to look at the other notation, you can say this is combin 106, which is also known as you know, 100 choose 6. So all of these are basically different notations of exactly the same thing. Is that okay? Uh, does everybody understand part 2? All right. So part 3, we are interested in outcomes of spot checking six fuzzies out of the shipping box that raise suspicion. So this time we have a event set, okay? Because remember, the omega out of an experiment are really just saying, okay, I don't care about the Furbies or properties of the Furbies. I only want to know if I were to ch choose six Furbies out of a box for testing, how many ways can I choose the Furbies, okay? That's what the first, the second question is answering. The third question is putting into the whole thing, like, okay, out of these, okay, out of 100 choose six, some are particularly interested, interesting to me because now I want to find out um, the outcome. Uh, we are interested in the outcomes of spot checking six Furbies out of a shipping box that, that raise suspicion. In other words, how many cases of the 100 choose six would actually raise suspicion? That's what question number three is, or question number, yeah, three is asking. The event set, therefore, consists of all the outcomes of spot checking six Furbies in a shipping box that raise suspicion. Describe in English what, char what, charati what characterizes each element of this event set. Okay. Does anyone want to tell me? Just 
describe it in English. I don't, I'm not looking for a mathematical mathematical description here. First of all, yes, go ahead. Yes. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Four or more of the chosen. Did I misspell chosen? That looks right to me. Huh? Oh, chosen, not Z. Chosen uh, fuzzies are packed. Okay, so that's leading to the next one. Okay, um, the next one is explain and formulate the calculation of the cardinality of the event set. Um, you may use a summation expression, which is probably advisable. Um, there's no need to actually compute the numerical answer. So the question is, um, we are only interested in the cardinality. This is not about the probability. It is just the cardinality of the set. So the first thing we want to know is, okay, this is a pretty loose description of you know what each element of the omega looks like. So if I were to give you two choices, okay, each element of omega is a set or each element of omega is a tuple, which one would it be? What is the difference? What is the difference of a tuple of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 versus a set with elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6? Exactly. So we are really looking you know, for each element is a set of six fuzzies. The event set, uh, in the event set, each element is a set of six fuzzies of which four or more are suspicious. Is that okay? All right. So knowing that, how do we answer part four, which is worth most of the points, like 40% of this particular question? So I'm going to put the you know, answer to the question before over here. So how I how would I do this? Now I said you know using a summation operator using a summation expression is allowed, which usually means you might want to consider doing that, right? So the question is, what are we summing, and you know what are we talking about here? So we want to look at the cardinality of e. So how would you how do you want to express that? So let's focus on. Um, how many of the elements of omega is going to have exactly four suspicious fuzzies? Okay, so let me let me rephrase that question. I, I'll write it here. Okay, the number of um, sets of six fuzzies in which exactly six, oh, excuse me, that was my bad, because I meant four, exactly four are suspicious. Okay, so we, we have a little, we, I'm breaking out here for a sub-problem to solve. How do I figure that out? So remember, you know, what I said earlier, you want to relate the problem, you know, that you're that you have to answer here with things that we have already been exposed to. So what does this remind you of? There are only really two main kinds of problems that we have seen. One would be a coin flip, you know, kind of problem. The other one is a lotto problem. So which one does it resemble? The lotto problem, exactly, because in the lotto problem, after a drawing, okay, we have five winning numbers, and then we have 64 non-winning numbers. In this case, we have um, eight hacked, you know, fuzzies, and then we have 92 non-hacked fuzzies. So what we are really asking here is, um, we are basically, you know, combining, you know, some of the suspicious ones and some of the non-suspicious ones to make a total of six. 
So that would be, okay, we're looking at some numbers that are winning numbers and some numbers that are non-winning numbers to make up the five numbers on the ticket. Okay, and we are looking for a very specific number of winning numbers versus you know the non-winning numbers. So this is about the same. Okay. So what do we do here? So you have to think about how many ways can we choose four of the of the eight hacked fuzzies. Okay, let me ask you one more time. <laughs> how many ways can we choose four out of the eight? hacked fuzzies because you know that's what we're looking for we are looking for four you know, fuzzies out of the six as a sample that would raise suspicion ordering is not important so that should limit to one single way to compute this number what what is that not six eight choose four okay so eight choose four would give us the number of ways to choose four out of the eight hacked fuzzies, which is the requirement because I want to know the number of sets where out of the six in the sample, four of those are suspicious or four of those are hacked. Okay, but is that the answer? In other words, yep, go ahead. The non-suspicious ones, right? So, how many ways can we choose? No, you're right. Ninety-two, choose two. Okay, because the ninety-two is representing the number of unhacked original fuzzies, out of which we only want two of those. So, this product becomes the actual number of ways to choose six fuzzies out of a box of 100 of which four are hacked and two are unhacked does that make sense and ordering is not important okay you know any way of mixing the four and the two is okay but does that reason does it remind you of the lotto ticket problem that we have talked we have talked about so that's the thing okay this is what you need to do on the day of the exam is to look at the question that you have to answer and then try to relate it to questions or problems that we have solved already. And then you're, you're trying to make a match as much as you can. Okay, cool. This is about four fuzzies that are suspicious, but it's not the answer to part four because part four says we want to know the cardinality of the entire event set, which means what, what is missing? Um, out of the six in the sample, maybe five of those are suspicious. Maybe all of them are suspicious, right? Okay, so how would I use a sigma notation to do this? Okay, so sigma i equals to some number to some number, and then we have some kind of expression you know, to the right-hand side of the sigma. So what is the variable here? In other words, you know, if you look at this specific case, which one is the variable? Which one is the one that's like, oh, we can just change that number and then we can now figure out you know, the uh, number of set of six fuzzies in which five are suspicious and then we can ch just change this one other number, it becomes you know, six. This thing, right? The four. So the four can become the five and then becomes a six. This one here is really six minus four, okay? So I wouldn't look at it as a two, okay? I would look at this as six minus four. So we have one single variable to determine everything. Okay, I'm just gonna pause here and see if this is making sense. Rewriting the two as a six minus four, because now we have one single value that needs to change when we say, oh, but what about you know the uh, number of sets of six fuzzies in which exactly five are suspicious? <laughs> change the four to a five? What about six? Change the four to a six? So that becomes our i. It becomes the variable that we use in the sigma notation because that is the thing that we have to vary across the three cases that we have to process. So i is going to range from four to six because i is basically dictating the number of suspicious fuzzies in a sample of six. 
then what we are summing is going to be 5 choose i times 92 choose 6 minus i. That would be the answer. So you kind of have to give me some explanation to you, like, you know, what each thing is representing. Um, but I'm just giving you the final, you know, answer here. But do we have any questions about the final answer to part four of this particular question? Um, I had a question about like what dictates whether a problem will be similar to the coin toss or similar to the lotto. So I the, um, the with or without replacement. There are two clues. The first clue is the total number of possible outcomes. Because when you toss a coin, there are only two possible outcomes. And then the second one is whether there's, it's re with replacement or without replacement. In a coin toss, it is with replacement. You can end up with all heads or all tails. But in this problem, it is without replacement. Once you choose something out of the collection, you don't put it back into the collection to be, so that it cannot show up again in a later trial. So those two are the most important clues you know, of whether it's a coin toss issue kind of problem, which is the binomial distribution, or it is a lotto problem where it is a combinatoric kind of problem. Combinatoric means that we are calculating permutations and uh, combinations. All right, so I'll be good with part four. Yes, go ahead. Um, the stuff that I just said, <laughs> verbally. Um, so I would start with something like this, okay? And then just say, in this case, you know, the four is the variable. And when we change the four to a five, you know, or whatever number, you know, that becomes, you know, the, the one of the things that we have to add up. So this becomes, you know, the equation, you know, to make it easier to express. You can always, you know, just kind of express it as, you know, 8 choose 4 times 92 choose 2 plus nine, 8 choose 5 times 92 choose 1 times, uh, plus, sorry, plus 8 choose 6 times 92 choose 0. Okay, that's also okay. You know, using the sigma notation just makes it a little bit easier to express the whole thing, but it's not required. So you can actually just kind of spell out the entire thing too. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. When you when you look at the outcomes, because in the case of the experiment, I'm really only looking at a spot check, but I did not care about the outcome. It didn't say anything about the outcome. And, you know, this is, okay, some people will try to solve this problem as if it is a binomial distribution because they may think, okay, so I, let me explain this, you know, which is erroneous line of reasoning. Some people may think, okay, so the chances of, take, of picking a fuzzy that is suspicious is 8 divided by 100. So it's a probability, right? So which is about the same about the same kind of thing as when you do a coin toss. You know, what are the chances that it will land on a head? But there's a difference between these two cases, because in this case, after the first fuzzy has been chosen, the chances of the second fuzzy, you know, being suspicious is not going to be eight divided by one hundred anymore. It doesn't matter which one you choose as the first one. The second one is either 7 divided by 99, because the first one is suspicious to begin with, or it is going to be 8 divided by 99, uh, excuse me, 91, because you chose one that is not suspicious to begin with. So the probability does not stay the same, whether you would choose another fuzzy that is going to be suspicious. And that's why the, the coin toss solution cannot be applied in this case, because the probability of choosing a fuzzy out of the box and it is suspicious is not constant. Whereas in the coin flip example, that probability is constant. Is that okay? 
Now, how, can we cast a problem where it is the same? Yes, when you have an infinitely large box of fuzzies, <laughs> and you know that 8% of the fuzzies are suspicious. And because the box has an infinite capacity, so after you pick one fuzzy out of the box, the probability of the next fuzzy being suspicious stays the same because the number of fuzzies is infinite and then the proportion stays the same as 8%. But in this case, it's clearly a finite box of 100 fuzzies. So it is not a binomial distribution. Is that okay? Okay, so because I want to explain the erroneous line of reasoning so that you can cross check yourself when you have any doubt, like, uh, but isn't this kind of the same thing as a binomial distribution where the chances of picking a suspicious fuzzy is just eight divided by 100? So you have to think about that and go like, oh, but what happens after I have chosen a fuzzy? What is the probability of the next fuzzy being suspicious? Oh, it's not eight divided by 100 anymore. It can be seven divided by ninety-nine, I think. Yeah, but anyway, the chance, the probability changes. So, so that's kind of important. All right. So we have part five. Okay. So this is just finishing the whole thing. What is the probability of of a spot check of six fuzzies in a shipping box that will discover the hack? Um, so that's going to be whatever the answer is for question number four, divided by something, because when you look at the probability in the case of the lotto ticket thing, it is always the cardinality of E divided by the cardinality of omega. So now what is the cardinality? The cardinality of E is already figured out, okay? You know, four to six, eight choose I times 92 choose six minus I. We figure that out in question part four, but what are we dividing that by? So remember the lotto problem, okay? Remember we had to calculate the probability of getting a ticket that will only get us a particular prize money. Do you guys remember that? This is kind of the same thing. So we have to divide it by the cardinality of big omega, which we figure out a little bit earlier. Which part? Which part of this question did we figure out the omega, the cardinality of omega? Hmm? Yep, exactly. Part two, which is 100 to 6. And that's the final answer. And once again, there is no need to compute the numerical answer. So you can just leave it like what I have here and not actually to compute the exact value. Are we okay with this question? Okay, all right. <clears throat> Are we ready to move on to the next one? We're still recording. Okay, sure, go ahead. I wonder what would be the outcome if someone is to copy and paste this entire word question and put it up to uh, chat GPT. I haven't tried that, yeah, but in an earlier semester, somebody actually did try that um, after the exam and chat GPT actually got almost 100% out of that one. <laughs> yeah, I don't have the text, uh, just the text portion. I do have it in the PDF side, okay. Copy, and you good? Okay, but now I'm on to a chat to GPD. <laughs> um, I was playing with OpenAI earlier today. You, know, you guys cannot see it because I'm just signing in right now. Okay, all right. So, okay, let's go. And then we just paste the whole question. All right. 
All right, so let me let me show you the answer here. This is this has to be entertaining. This is I haven't tried this yet you know, for this class. All righty. Oh, look at that! It actually got some of the answers right. Okay, so let's let's look at the uh, output of uh, Chat and GPT. Part one. See, it even breaks up all the different parts and all the subcomponents. Um, how many trials are there? There are six trials in the experiment, one for each fuzzy pick in the spot check. Wow. What is the number of possible outcomes from the first trial? 100, okay. Um, are the trial outcomes with or without replacement or without replacement? Okay, another point for the chat GPT. Is the ordering of outcomes between trials important? No, the ordering is not important as each fuzzy is treated independently which is not how I would explain it, because I would just explain it as we just want to know whether a fuzzy is present or absent you know, in the set of six as a sample. Part two, okay. It got part two right. The total number of possible outcomes for a spot check of six fuzzy is given by the combination formula, blah, 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 okay, 100 choose six, same notation. Part th three, the event set consists of all outcomes where more than three fuzzies in the spot check exhibit different behavior. Another full point here for part three. Part four is where things go a little bit south. <laughs> the calculation of the cardinality of the event set involves summing the number of ways to choose four, five, and six fuzzies with different behavior out of six picked. Then what about the other two? It did not account for how many ways can we choose the other two fuzzies out of a sample of six. So this is probably going to be a two out of four-ish kind of answer because it's missing a really key component to you know, the whole calculation. So with that, you know, part five is also going to be a partial credit because you know, it's, it's going to quote the answer from you know, part four. The probability of discovering tax, uh, discovering tax GPT's scheme is the ratio of the cardinality of the event set to the total number of possible outcomes it does not give me an actual expression. It just you know, tells me that, okay, it's the cardinality of the event set versus you know, the cardinality of omega, but it doesn't actually give me the number. So I would call this one a maybe one out of four kind of answer. Yep. Funny because I just introduced. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it gave me a different part for giving me like the, it accounted for the state. Isn't that interesting? Because chat GPT is probabilistic. As with any type of neural network based mechanism, it is probabilistic. The way chat GPT works is it is still a neural net. You know, I know it is a very vast and complicated, you know, multi-layered 90, I think it's 96 layer, you know, uh, neural net, which is huge, okay? But it is still a neural network, which means the way it generates something is probabilistic. You give it something to evaluate, the answer is probabilistic, and then that answer, okay, based on the prompt, okay, which is the pace of the question itself, it will give you probability or a, a weight you know, of what should be next. But since it's just a weight, it is not a deterministic thing. So it would just say, 96% uh, of the time we go for this answer, and then 2% of the time we go for that, and then the other 2% we go for that. So that's why you, know, you can ask, you can use the same prompt every single time, and they give you a slightly different answer every single time. When you're writing an English paper that is not too significant, okay, you know, how you phrase a certain sentence, it's like, mm, okay, there are different ways to phrase the same thing and they mean the same thing. But when it comes to calculations like this, missing that 92 choose you know, 6 minus k is a big deal because it is determining whether the answer is right or not. So that is a very interesting observation. And that's why I would not trust your know, chat GPD to do my homework. Yes? Yes, yes. Not only that he has seen it, it has seen it a lot of times. Because you know, as a neural net, in order to train it to the point where it can solve this question, it has to be exposed to this type of problem solving and the solution to that many, many times already. We are, we are talking about at least thousands of times. Because your know, chat GPT is not really reasoning through this, 
it is actually just looking at the pattern. And it doesn't even understand the concepts of what is a combination, you know, what is without replacement and, and whatnot. Chat GPT is what we call a LLM, which is a large language model, which means everything are just tokens, words. And it's just looking at the pattern of words. It's looking at the pattern of sentences, the pattern of paragraphs, and so on. But because of the samples that have ex been exposed to, it can come to you know, the behavior that we see here, which seems to be intelligent. But it really is just based on patterns they have seen. Yeah. Uh, okay, I can ask it a, a different question. Okay, for those of you who are in my CISP 310 class, you will probably get a kick out of this one. So we can, I can ask you how, uh, what instruction, what instruction of TTP uh, overwrites memory locations? <laughs> Evil laughter. I totally missed the mark. Okay, TTP to it it stands for tactics, technique, techniques, and procedures, which is not tax toy processor. So let me rephrase that question a little bit. <laughs> but as you can see, it has it had no exposure to my lecture material, which is actually kind of strange because I put all my stuff on a um, open you know server. So it had no exposure, so it cannot answer that question, which is, you know, kind of interesting. Describe tax toy processor, and it might actually do something to link to tech GPT because it's in the same context. We'll see. <laughs> I do not have specific information because it only has uh, the last knowledge update is January 2022, but I have been using Tax Toy Processor for a lot longer than January you know, 2022, which basically means if the crawler does not crawl onto my website, it has no exposure and therefore has no knowledge of my toy processor. Huh? Because it really is just a toy. It's just as little tool that I made, you know, to so that people can understand what is inside the processor, you know, how instructions work, how what opcodes are, and so on and so forth. When, you know, this is what I use to teach CISB 310. And there are a few poor souls in this class, you know, who are currently my students in that class. <laughs> the bright side of that is I just talked to a student, you know, of mine, you know, he graduated in probably 2021-ish, and he's now looking to apply for graduate school. And he said, you know, after he transitioned to, I'm not gonna name the university, four-year university, he said, you know, um, his he and other students, you know, agree that, you know, it's not challenging, you know, once they transition to a four-year university, because, you know, the concepts that we talk about in my classes is, um, in depth enough that you know it does not make the transition to a four year university difficult now if you're going to berkeley it may be a different story <laughs> but in general you know the feedback is you know yeah you guys are, people are going to be okay when they transfer all right so question 3 out of 4 this one is a straight up just trace the algorithm so part one, define admissible heuristic value H2101, B1, V1, and V3, V1, V1, V1 in such a way that vertex three is added to the set O more than once when the A star algorithm runs. Okay, so this may not be as straightforward as we see it seems. So the first thing you want to do is really to understand what the graph looks like. So you, you know, drawing a picture may be helpful. So I'm going to do it on the side. So we got, we got V. I'm going to forget about the V and just write the zero, okay? Because you know that takes up less space and it's quicker to do that. So we got V0, V1, V2, and V3. And there's an edge from V3 to V1, so 3 to 1. 
as an edge. And in that case, it cost 15. Okay, that's a distance of 15. Um, from V2 to V3, that's one. V2 to V3 is a 56. Okay. Um, there's another edge from V0 to V3. Okay. And that is 22. And then the first one is from V2 to V0. V2 to V0. All right. And that is 24. So there are only four edges in this case. Let me just double check. V2 to V0 is 24. V0 to V3 is 22. 3 to 1 is a 15 and then 2 to 3 is a 56. Okay, very good. And we know the destination is V1. Okay, that's part of the first sentence. So we just kind of look at V1 special as a destination. That's usually how we you know, mark a final state in a final in a finite state automata. You know, so you know, that's I'm just saying that this is a typical way to say this is the final destination. All right, so the question is, if I apply the A star algorithm, I want to mess around with the heuristics so that V3, which is this one here, is going to be um, added to the set O more than once when the A star algorithm runs. Okay, so how would you solve this problem? We can try that, actually. It'll be very interesting. If ChatGPT can solve this one, I'll be really impressed. And I can see some people are probably calling, okay, let's give it a try. All right, so how do you solve this problem? Now, ChatGPT may not be able to solve this problem because it doesn't know how the algorithm is specified. So it can probably be look up and go like, okay, we know what is the A star algorithm, but unless that specification of the A star algorithm use the same variable name, like big O for the set, it's not going to be able to solve the problem. Is that making any sense? So I wouldn't hold my breath for chat GPT to be able to solve this problem. Okay, so what do you do? Okay, I just gave you a hint of how to get started with this particular question. So this question is not a straight up your know, A star algorithm question because I am not giving you the heuristic. I'm asking you to come up with admissible heuristics so that V3 is added to O more than once. We want to, okay, yes. So we want to trick the algorithm to thinking a particular path is short, but it, in reality it is not. So we want, to, we want to use the heuristic to trick it. So the other thing we also need is um, the starting point is V2. So I'm going to highlight the V2 also. So this is our starting point. All right. So how do we do this? So first of all, okay, first thing first, okay, super important is do you have the algorithm with you? Okay, I'm not asking about now, okay, I'm asking about when you take the test, having the algorithm with you is important, okay, unless you have it memorized, like, you know, in my head, okay, but because I wrote that stuff, you know, I tend to remember that stuff, okay, so the first thing is, Brain, whatever is important. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yep, so the algorithm is a form of definition, so make sure that you bring that with you, okay? It is still open book and open notes, so that means you know, anything that you think may be helpful and is printed on paper or it's handwritten on paper, bring that with you. So in this case, the algorithm itself is important. So the next thing we are, we are going to do is to look into the algorithm. And let me see, where's my, I'm looking for the browser window for 
CISP 440. Okay, I can do slightly better than that. Okay. Um, you cannot see it here because I'm doing this on the other side. Okay, this is helpful. And we can now bring this to your view. All right. So the first thing is to go to the algorithm, which is, um, I can just do a search here, graph. Here we go. Pretty sure it's open as one tab already, but we can always just reopen it. Okay. So now we go to the A star algorithm. This is not Dijkstra's. So here is the algorithm, okay? A bunch of initialization and parameters, but the actual algorithm is here, starting with a while. So what is the next step? I'm asking specifically about, okay, I want this vertex to be reintroduced or introduced in the set of O twice. So what is the next thing you're gonna do? Yes, okay, very good, okay? So let me repeat that you know, just to make sure it's recorded. Figuring out what, you know, where in the algorithm are we adding a vertex to the set O, okay? There are two places, okay? <clears throat> one place is not too relevant to us because one place is up here, okay? And that has to do with how we initialize the set O. But that only has to do with the starting point, which is vertex two. So this is not helping us, okay? Because V3 is not a start vertex. So it is not introduced, it is not put into O because of the initialization. So you have to now say, okay, so what else can we put something into O? Uh, oh, this is an assignment, okay, but is that gonna help us? The answer is no, because it's only going to remove things from O, okay? Not gonna be helpful to answer that question. So there's only one place that can add a vertex to O, and we need that to happen twice, okay? So now how do we make that happen? What is the, your next step, okay? You, you locate this statement here already. So what is your next step? Find out how to get to it, right? So how do we get to it? Is the conditional statement, the condition of the conditional statement has to be true. So that means whatever T is, has to be less than G of N in order for N to be introduced into O. So in this case, N is our V3, which also means you know we have to make sure that g of c plus d of c n, whatever the c is, you know, needs to be less than g of n twice. The first time is a given because you know g of n is start with an infinity value. That's how we initialize anything that is not the start vertex. So the first time is a given, okay, not a problem. But we the the, the question is how do we get it to do it again? So now that part has to do with the graph itself. So now you have to look at the graph, and V3 is right here, okay? This is on a critical path to the destination, which means you know any path from V2 to the destination has to go through V3. There are two possible paths. One is from two to zero to three and then to one. Then the other one is from two to three and then to one. Are we okay with that? We have to somehow use the heuristic value to trick it to take one path that is not actually the shortest one, and then only for the algorithm go like, oh man, that's not the best way, and then explore the other one. Yep. Okay, all right, okay. So, so one thing we do have to do is to find out what, is, what are the actual links of the two paths, right? So one path is gonna add 56 and five, you know, so I can actually write this out, okay? So from, from two to three to one has a length of 56 plus one, which is a 61. Oh, that's a 15, you're right. So that means it's a 71. And then from two to zero to three to one is 24 plus 22, which is a 46, 46 plus 15, 61, okay. Okay, so we now know which one is the shorter one. The question is, can we trick it to take the longer one first? 
so that later on if it figures out it was like oh, man this is not the shortest one and now we have to go for the shorter one so now you have to ask the question what is the role that a heuristic is playing when we prioritize what to explore next okay all right so how would you do this okay um, changing the heuristic from two to one is not going to do it. It's not going to do a single thing because you know that is actually not really important. In other words, um, the heuristic value from two to one, which is this one here, is not something that is really important. All right. So what is important? What do you think is actually important? What determines which one to go for after you know we get started with the algorithm? Yes. So the heuristic from three to one versus the heuristic from zero to one, that may be important, right? Because you know, now, because from two, you have two choices. You can either go to zero or you can go to three. The question is, can we trick it to go for the longer path and then later on to find a, okay, that, that sucks. And what that means is the heuristic Hmm. Oh, th th this one is actually easier than that. Okay, I just realized it's easier than that because okay, out of the first loop, just right out the uh, right out of the gate, two is chosen out of O. It has two outgoing edges. One going edge is going to here. One outgoing edge is coming to here. That accounts for the first time that we are introducing three into the set O. Is that okay? So we have to make sure that we re-explore the three. But if you think about it, um, after that, we want to. Okay, I'm just let me think here. Go ahead. Yep. 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 Because there are two paths. We wanted to go for the wrong path, right? So we want to make the wrong path look attractive. Now, this is the main difference between the A star algorithm and Dijkstra's algorithm. Dijkstra's algorithm only look at the current length of the shortest path from a vertex to a destination. This one takes into consideration of the heuristic, which means the prioritization of what we take out of O to explore is not based on the actual, just the length from two to three, which is known already to be a 56, but you also have to add to it the heuristic of three to one. And we can make that as little as possible to entice the algorithm and go like, yeah, go for this one, because the other way is really long. So the other way, the 24 is known already, and we just have to make it realistic so that the heuristic value from zero to one is actually 22 plus 15, which is the most you can give, you know, in the case of the heuristic value from zero to one. Does that make sense? Okay, so let me, let me just write it down here, okay? So what we want is this one doesn't matter. We can, we can just give it a zero. Uh, from zero to one is we want to make it as long as possible because we want to make the actual shortest path as unattractive as possible, okay? So that can be 22 plus 15, which is a 37. Okay, so we want to make this a 37, which is the most you can give it because a, an admissible heuristic means it is not overestimating. And we can see that the actual length of the shortest path from zero to one is truly just 22 plus 15, which is a 37. That's the most we can give it. And then uh, from V3 to V1, is going to be as attractive as it goes, okay? Because you know that's one of the consideration. 
this is probably as good as we can go because it cannot be we cannot go negative and then the last one not a problem it's guaranteed a zero because we are looking at a vertex to itself is that okay so with this okay we then run the algorithm so part one is just that okay um and then part two is to make use of the result of part one just so that we can verify that we are actually going through vertex three or it is introduced in the set O twice, okay? So let me, let's just go for the trace. And this should be enough information to do everything that I need to do. All right, so the initialization is O is starting with the start vertex, which is just your vertex two here. Um, the previous of everything is unknown to begin with. The G value of um, the thing, so the start vertex is the only one that has a zero. Everything is an infinity. So zero, they're not unknown, they're just infinity. The F value is the G value plus the heuristic from a vertex to the destination. In this case, it's V1. So that means, you know, um, they're all the same because the heuristic value from V2 to um, the destination is also a zero. Zero plus zero is a zero. This is infinity, bad penmanship there. Okay, so this is how we initialize everything and then we follow the algorithm. I can do this. You can probably not do this, okay, because I got the whole algorithm already memorized. So that we pick, you know, the... Okay, first of all, what is the exit condition of the A star algorithm? Does anyone remember that without reading the algorithm? Because the A star algorithm has a somewhat complicated exit condition or stay in loop condition. What is that? Okay. Yes, it has something to do with G, it has something to do with F. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but that's good. Okay, go ahead. The G of the destination. So we need at least one vertex in O to have an F value that is less than the G value to the destination. In other words, there's potentially a shorter path, okay? Because the, the F value is an estimate of the entire path from the start vertex through a particular vertex to the destination. So as long as the F value of one vertex is less than the G value of the destination, which is the length of the known shortest path to the destination, we still have hope to find a shorter path. Now, is that really a shorter path? Yeah, that depends on the heuristics, okay? So that is the condition. So when we look at this thing here, the F value of two is definitely less than the G value of, of one. So it meets that requirement. So we get into the loop. Then we choose uh, one element out of the set where it has the least F value, which is not really a big consideration here because we only got one element in O to begin with. We don't have to choose. So we just say, okay, you'll see it's going to be two. We choose that one out of the whole thing. And then Q, okay, this is my bad. It is supposed to be a set. So it is now an empty set because we have just chosen it. Now we look at all the outgoing edges, all the outgoing neighbors of two, and there are two of those. One is zero, and the other one, oh, okay, wrong place to put that. Okay, let me, let me correct it. <laughs> okay. My touch just you know, changed the... What? The? Okay. Turn off the other touch gesture thing. Um, system bar, pinch. Okay, let's see if that works. Let's see, no, I cannot scroll. Okay, I think it has to do with my finger getting too far down. So let me turn off the other touch and gestures too. Um. Maybe it's that? I don't think so. Anyway, okay, let me go back. So we have two outgoing edges from two. One is going to zero. The other one is going to three. Okay, 
So when we are at zero, okay, if we're going from two to zero, what is t? So now you have to remember the equation. t is g of c plus the distance from c to n. Okay, so let's look at what is g of c or g of two. g of two is a zero, and then plus the distance from two to zero, which according to the distance function is a 24, okay? So zero plus 24 is a 24. So that means the t is a 24 here. And then we have to ask now, did we just find a shorter path from the start vertex, which is vertex two, to vertex three? Well, what is the shortest, what is the length of the shortest path to vertex three at this point? Exactly. It is an infinity and is 24 less than infinity? Yep, okay, so we got a bunch of stuff to update. So we have 24 here, and then we have a two here, because in order to go to vertex three, nope, it's a zero, right? We're looking at zero. Okay, never mind. my bad, my bad. Okay. Okay, because I was updating the wrong thing because we have to look at g of zero. So g of zero is updated to a 24 from an infinity. And then previous of v zero is gonna be v two. And we have to add vertex and zero into the set, like so. Oh, and also the f value. The f value is the g value plus the heuristic from v0 to the destination, which is v1. So according to this, v0 to v1 has a heuristic value of 37. 37 plus 24 is 61. So the f value of v, v0 is a 61. That looks right. Looks very unattractive right now, okay? Are we good so far? So I can do this because I have the whole algorithm memorized. I do not suggest you to do the same now that you know, since you can bring your, you know, any note and any print out. So I would just print it out and bring it with you. Okay. All right. So now we move on to the other outgoing neighbor, which is vertex, vertex three. So we are now trying to figure out what is t, g of two, which is a zero plus the distance from two to three, the distance from two to three is 56, okay? So that means T is 56. Sounds like a pretty big number, but 56 is still less than infinity. So that means, ah, okay, we just found a shorter path from the start vertex to vertex three in this case. And so we update the G to be just 56. And then the F value is the G value plus the heuristic from V3 to V1. And we chose a heuristic of zero early on. So that means this is really just also 56. The previous of vertex three is vertex two. And then we put three into the set the first time. Okay, are we good so far? Okay. So now that we have two elements in O, okay, once again, we want to know, we want to know, are we done yet with this algorithm? Is at least one vertex in O having an F value that is less than the G value of the destination? Well, the G value of the destination is still infinity, so I think we are good there. So now we have to choose one of the two elements in the set O. It's either vertex zero or vertex three. Which one has a lower F value is the one that we are going to choose. So you look at those two, 0 and 3. F of 0 is 61. F of 3 is 56. We go like, yeah, we're going to choose, oh, we're going to choose the one that is smaller. So that's going to be V3. So we remove V3 from the set and say this is now chosen. It is removed from the set O. And now we look at the outgoing edges, or in this case, a singular to vertex one. And then we have to compute the T value. So we have to look at the G value of vertex three, which is a 56, plus the distance of the edge from three to one. The distance of the edge from three to one is a 15. So now we have what, 20, 
what was it? 56, right? 56, which is this number, plus 15, which is about 71, okay? So 71 is T. And then we ask, is, is 71 less than the G value of vertex 1? The G value of vertex 1 right now is still at infinity, which is greater than 71. So it's time to update this one. So we update G of V1 to be 71. Uh, the F value is super easy because we are already at the destination vertex. So the heuristic value is going to be a zero. So that's going to be, this is just another 71. And we update the previous of V1 to be V3. So we have a three over here. And then we add vertex one to the set. So the set now has zero and one in it. Are we good so far? Okay, so if you're not familiar with the algorithm and you don't have it in front of you, that's okay because everything is being recorded. So that means you know, when you re-watch this, I would suggest you to watch it while following the algorithm, okay? All right, so are we done yet? Mm, let's check. Because this time, G of destination is 71. It is not infinity anymore. So we really have to kind of look up the table and say, are we done? So we have two vertices left in O, and the question is, does at least one of these two vertices have an F value that is less than 71? So we look at F of zero, it's a 61, which is less than 71, so we are still good, okay? We still cannot terminate the loop yet at this point. So the next thing we have to do is to, out, is to say, out of these two, which one has a smaller F value? V0 has an F value of 61, V1 has an F value of 71, 61 is the smaller one, so we choose F uh, V0 this time, and then we take it out of the set. The set has one vertex one left in it, now we have to look at the outgoing edges of V0, which is just three. So this is the second time, hopefully, that we're gonna add three to the set O, but we have to go through the calculation, right? Yeah, we have to figure out what is T. So G of zero is 24, and then the edge from zero to three is has a distance of 22. So uh, what are we adding here? 24 plus 22 is 46. So T is 46 here. The question is, is 46 less than the G value of V3 at this point? The answer is yes, because G of F3, of vertex three, is 56. 46 is less than the 56. So now we, we got some stuff to update. So we update the 56 to be a 46. And then we update um, F of V3 also, which is G of V3 plus the heuristic from uh, three to one, the heuristic from three to one is a zero. We determined that earlier. So that means you know, this is also just gonna be 46. Um, let's see, we have to update the previous of three to be zero. So we update that here. And then we have to introduce, we have to add uh, vertex three back to the set. So now we have one three. So as far as you're know, verifying you know, that three is back in introduced into O twice, we are done with that validation because we have just seen that V3 is added once here, it's added once over here. But since we are close to getting the whole thing done and this is all we can do for today, so on Wednesday, we're gonna move on to question number four for the Dijkstra's algorithm problem. So might as well just finish this, right? Okay, so we are done with the for each loop here when we are done with all these updates, we're going back to the while loop. The while loop now has two elements in O, we are asking, are we done yet? The question is basically asking, does any one of the vertices in O, does at least one have an F value that is less than G of V1? All right, so F value of one is a 71, F of three is a 46. Ah, 46 is less than you know, G of the vertex, which is a 71. So we are not done. And now, and now we have to choose you know, one of the two vertices. 
where it has the lowest f value. So we are looking at f of v1, which is a 71, versus f of v3, which is a 46. Yeah, 46 seems a little bit smaller. So we choose vertex 3 here. And then we remove it from the set, like so. And now we have to look at the outgoing edge of 3, which we have kind of seen already. It is 1. But this time, we have to recompute the t because it has changed. The g value of 3 has changed to 46. So when you add to the distance of 3 to 1, which according to the distances is 15. So 15 plus 46 is a 61. So now we have 61 as our t, and we compare that to the g value of um, vertex 1. The g value of vertex 1 is 71. 61 is less than that, so we have to update. So this becomes 61. This also becomes 61 because the heuristic value from v1 to v1 is 0 guaranteed because you know, it is on the same vertex. Um, and then we update the previous of three of one to be three. So that means the three is, oh, okay. It's, I put a three here because you know, even though we are not technically changing it, but it is still an update. So we still have to put a value in that cell. And then we have to add one back to the set, which is already here. So now we are done with a for each loop and we go back to the while loop. We only have one vertex left in O, and we're asking the same question. Is the F value of at least one vertex in O less than the G value of the destination? So this time you look at this and go like, okay, let's take a look at uh, F of V1. F of V1 is 61. Let's look at G of V1, which is also 61. 61 is not less than 61. So we cannot meet the requirement to go for another iteration. Now we are done. All right. So are we okay with this particular example and how to reason out how we choose the value for the heuristics? Because that really is the most important part of this question is how do you choose the heuristic so that we introduce V back, I mean, vertex one back into the set no, vertex 3, okay, we reintroduce V3 into the set O twice. But did you guys understand the reasoning? How we track, how I track them down? Okay, where in the algorithm do we do that? Right here. How do we get to that part of the algorithm? Uh, we kind of need that condition of the conditional statement to be true. And how do we get that conditional, that condition of the conditional statement to be true? Oh, we are looking at the F value. We want to give it an erroneous you know, um, estimate first, only to bring us to the, oh, not the shortest path. And then we have to go back and go like, okay, fine, you know, this is the other path, you know, which did not look as good because I intentionally, you know, structure the heuristics so that it does not look as good. All right. So is that, is this helping, you know, in terms of you know, preparing for the final exam? but you already know that your exam is not going to look like this. It's the way to reason, okay, that is important. Where do we start? Reading the question, okay? What is it asking? What is the definition that is related? How do you relate, you know, as much as possible what is given to you to the definition that is related to that question? And then you start from there. Are we doing okay? So on Wednesday, which is our last day of lecture, I will go over the next question. Okay, come on, wake up. Oh, right, because I disabled the, the touch, so it won't do that anymore. We do have class, what? We have class on Wednesday. On Monday, we do not have class after Thursday. So this is universal to all your classes. Thursday is the last day of instruction, which means you won't have class meetings, like normal class meetings, from Friday and all the way through the finals week. So our last lecture is Wednesday. 
All right, so let me just uh, do this one more thing and then we are ready to go. Okay, so on Thursday, I mean Wednesday, sorry. So on Wednesday, we're going to go through this particular question. And this one is really just to trace Dijkstra's algorithm, which I think out of all the questions, this is the by far the easiest. Because you know, once you know how to trace the algorithm, this one is just a straight up trace. So if I were you, I would answer this question first, just to get me all the points for this particular question, then move on to the, some of the more difficult ones. But that's assuming that you know the algorithm or have it right available to you at the exam. So that means you, know, you, can, you can start to prepare the material for the final exam. And I would start as early as possible so that you don't come up and, like, you know, and, and rush the whole, the whole process. Because rushing means you know, you're likely to forget about something. All right, so I will see you guys on Wednesday. And upload the recording. Yep. Um, next week, normal office hour also, right? No, no, no. I have, okay, this is important. I do have office hours.